Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, June 30th, and we are picking up with our study of the gospel in the stars. We are under the sign of Pisces. Last week we talked about Pisces. Remember, we're in the chapter right now that's talking about the, that our blessings are in advance. They're on hold. The section that we're in now, the middle section, we have the first four of the 12 zodiac signs that the sun goes through the elliptical path. Then we have five through eight in the middle. That's where we are now. Then we'll get to the next. The, this set in the middle is talking about the redeemed, the people that the first four talked about the Lord coming in his suffering for. He came in his suffering for who? For the redeemed, seen in these uh, constellations in the middle, Pisces being one of them. Pisces uh, is a picture of two fishes. Uh, you see one pointing north and one that's on the elliptical path. Um, in Hebrew, it's dagim, D-A-G-I-M. I-M makes it plural. Fishes make us think of multitudes. It's people, in this case, not literal fishes, but that there's a multitude of people that are redeemed through the blood of the Lord. This is talking about people from all the way in the past, the very beginning, all the way through to 2021, and ever far in the future until we do receive those blessings that are ours by being home with the Lord and having that be our eternal abode. We know that day is coming. When we looked at Pisces, we saw that the Bible commentators and ancient Jewish authorities all agreed that the sign Pisces was always in reference to Israel that whatever was happening with it was in relation to what God had, had promised to Israel. This sign does foreshadow a multiplication. We see it, Israel has been blessed to multiply and will always continue to. In other words, there, there will always be a seed called Israel. And we also see that the blessings of the children of promise come to, to uh, those that are in the Messiah, the redeemed, this also includes the body of Christ. So what we are seeing is, it's not just for Jewish believers, but it's for Gentile believers also, that we are who the Lord redeemed by his atoning work on the cross. The upward fish could speak about the spiritual seed. You could see it that way, the, the, uh, those that are saved by faith in Yeshua Jesus, coming into the blessings and the promises, and if you see it that way, then the fish on the elliptical would be the nas national Israel, would be the natural. It would be those that will receive the fulfillment of the promises that God made to the nation of Israel. Now, it's just one way that, that some chose to look at it. I'm not saying you have to look at that that way, but we do know that people like to say, oh, well, I'm of Abraham, even when they weren't born through the Jewish line that Abraham was foreshadowing of. And they say that because they're of the spiritual seed of Abraham. We know that out of Abraham's seed, singular, came Yeshua Jesus, Galatians 3.16. He is the promised seed that would bring blessing to the world. And those who come into faith are called the spiritual seed of Abraham. That's why they get that. So I'm just pointing out that there can be a spiritual seed, that's believers, and there can be an earthly seed, which is the promises God gave to the nation of Israel, not dependent on their obedience, but on his faithfulness. Romans 11 speaks to their future of those blessings, what I'm talking about. So with that in mind, we're going to look a little more at these two fish. We're going to uh, see that there's one other view that was given by one of my sources. And I think before I say it, yeah, let me back up just a little bit before I give that view. Okay. I've just brought out how we can be speaking of Israel as a nation and how we can be speaking of spiritual. God's people are seen as fish in scripture. The Lord said to his Talmudim, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Not fishers in the sea, they already were fishers in the sea, but fishers of men. And we know that, that he sent them, or, or uh, they were to go to all the nations bringing the gospel. That would be to the Gentile world also. Now what we're going to see is that um, that even though we are saved, and I want to be careful how I phrase this, our salvation is guaranteed. 
This isn't money back guarantee. <laughs> Nobody wants, they didn't pay anything out to begin with, so they have nothing to get back. But this is the Lord's free blood given in atonement for us. It is guaranteed. Even though we have not received those blessings yet in fullness, we know that they are ours. That's why when we go into the next sign, and we're not quite there yet, but if you look at the chart that I passed out, you can see the woman chain. You can see chains up on, on her arms. I'm trying to mimic what she looks like. Roger's pointing to it. She's bound. Even though the promises are hers, she's bound. We are in that boat right now. We'll talk about that more when we get to Andromeda or however I'm supposed to say her name. Um, but the point is, we're not free to receive our, fully our blessings as yet. We have human bodies that are still decaying. We are stuck here on earth. We can't be in the new Jerusalem, which will be our headquarters, which is in heaven with the Lord right now. We can't be there and then back down here on earth. If we're there, we're there for good. So that's what is meant by this. What we're going to see is that, that, um, that there is a sea monster. Cetus. This is going to represent Satan. We'll learn more about him later, but we're going to see that, that the people will be freed and brought back to their land, even by fishers. Yermia, Jeremiah 16, 14 to 16, refers to this, that God would send fishers to fish his people out. That's speaking of the Jewish people who have been scattered among the nations and those who are coming into saving faith who he will bring back home. We see it literally fulfilled at the end of the tribulation when the believing Jewish people will be brought into the land of Israel to live in millennial rule and reign under Messiah in Israel for a thousand years. That's the earthly and the earth promises that have been given. Now, here's one other slight view that I liked that one of my sources gave. They looked at the two fishes and they said that made them think of the two churches out of the seven in the book of Revelation during the uh, ap ap apologetic time, I can't even say it, end times, we know it goes into the tribulation. All seven churches do not go into the tribulation. We know that it starts with uh, the Laodicean church, which is a church that thinks it's fine. It's not. It, it thinks it's clothed and it's naked. It thinks it sees and it's blind. We know that this is the, the false church. This is not the true on fire serving the Lord church called Philadelphia that we are in right now. When we look at those seven churches, we see periods of time through history that make us know that this is the period of the church age, but we also know that the principles of each church applies. So we look at two churches that suffered persecution during that the, the church age, okay? One is the Philadelphia church and the other is Smyrna. Both of these churches were told that they'd be persecuted by the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan is those who say that they are Jews, but they are not real Jews. What does that mean? They're not in saving faith fully the, the, the spiritual Jews that they are to be. That would be those that, that are serving Satan, okay? They come against the church. You, I would look at it like the Pharisees in Yeshua's day. They were the leaders of the, the Jewish population, but they came against Messiah. They didn't accept him as Messiah. That would be who they would be talking about. They looked at these two fish as those two churches, and they said that the one fish that is rising is the Philadelphia church that rises even though it's persecuted. It rises to heaven, and it actually, as a church, catch up, as a church, as a whole body, it will actually be raptured out of this earth without dying. Okay, that's for those who are alive when the Lord does return, First Thessalonians 4, catches the believers up to be with the Lord in the air. So they pictured that, they said they thought the fish going up was a picture of that, that the, the fish caught by the Lord, shall I put it that way, will be raptured out, persecuted, but not martyred. Then they said that the fish on the elliptical would be pictured by Smyrna, the believers who were martyred. That even though they didn't get to go up in a rapture, they lost their earthly life, but they still come into the blessings that are theirs. And we know that martyrdom does nothing to the spiritual promises that God has given. That 
that the scripture even says, don't worry about the one who can take your body. Worry about the one who can condemn your soul. You, what is it if man gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So they saw it as a picture of that, that even though there are those who do suffer persecution to death, they still are then ushered into the presence of the blessings that are theirs to be received. And that I will agree with whether the two fish represent that or not. I just thought it was a very interesting view and wanted to bring it to you. When we move past now into the three small um, pictures, the decons, the three small decons, we also looked last week at the first one called the band. If you look at the picture that says Pisces that Roger has up right now, it would be where the two, the streams that are, you know, tying those two fish together, we're talking about that band, that knot, where they would be tied together, and then you see the string or a rope or whatever you want to call it go to the two fish, okay? Mm -hmm. We saw that that was the band or the bridle and that it was a picture of, um, a, well, okay, here's where we're going to get into the whole thing. Mm -hmm. The picture on the right, my right, your left, shows that that band is connected to what you can't see totally there, but that's the sea monster, that's Cetus. Remember how we just talked about the fact that Satan has Andromeda or Andromeda bound, okay? We're going to see again how she's bound, but how she'll come free. Uh, but the, the, this band is reminding that, um, but I want you to also notice, um, okay, the band passes through the foot of Aries. Roger, can you get where you can show that? Okay, Aries is right there. Okay, see how the foot of Aries is right there? Perfect. That's the ram or the lamb. Remember, that's an animal that, that shows the, um, well, the ram is a, the sacrificial animal picture of the Lord being the Lamb of God who gives his life for, uh, for us. So what we're seeing is a picture of the Messiah here who unites and upholds us that we are in his possession. Even though Cetus is trying to bind, notice that Messiah is represented, he paid the price. He gave his life. He was a sacrificial animal. We're going to be moving in very quickly to seeing him in his victorious state, where we won't see a slain lamb, we'll see a resurrected lion of the tribe of Judah. We'll see the, the victory that is there. So even though Satan is doing all he can to bind us, that band is broken by the Messiah who shed his blood in, a, in payment of what we owe. Remember when we looked at the scales, there was a price we couldn't pay, and he paid that price in full. With that in mind, now look at Andromeda, which is right there, you know, the top fish is yeah, going right into her. There you go. And we see this chained woman. She's chained by her feet. You see the chains there a little bit, but you can see the chains better by the hands. She is in misery. She's in trouble. She is bound. She is helpless. She's in the sky, but in my mind, the way it looks, it almost looks like she's falling. You know, she, she's just in a, in a bad place, okay? Um, we know that the redeemed can feel bound, afflicted, chained, but we know who breaks those chains. We know that we're not really bound, that he cannot steal from us what is ours. Let me take you to 2 Timothy. I told you you were going to go somewhere else first. Sorry, I changed the order by accident. Go with me to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Shaul Paul was pouring into Timothy his son, adopted son in the faith. He knew that Timothy's going to go on and be the leader. He's passing the baton very soon because his life will end. So the, the spiritual father of the church is, is training his son to be strong and ready to, to be in that position. And in verse 12, when he's speaking to him, he says, Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, what will happen? Because you want to live in a life pleasing to the Lord, everything's going to be wonderful. It's going to be a utopia. You'll never have a problem on this earth. It's going to be trouble-free. 
Anybody buy that? No. <laughs> what version? I think, no. yeah, what version? <laughs> Second Timothy 3, verse 12. I think anyone who buys that lie just needs to climb out of bed in the morning and find how false that lie is. It tells us any who want to live in a godly way in Messiah Yeshua will be persecuted. Remember, we just mentioned we're in the Philadelphia period. It's a church on fire for the Lord. It is not that they're being corrected because they're not doing right, but it is because they're doing something for the Lord. Who does Satan go after? The one who's already in his camp? No, he's got them. The one who's lazadaisical, doing nothing, complacent, sitting and just waiting for whatever to happen? No, he's got them. They're, in, in essence, they're the bound ones. But the ones that are on fire for the Lord, that want to please the Lord, want to serve the Lord, they're the ones that everything's going to come after. They're going to suffer persecution. This is not to be considered, uh-oh, what did I do wrong? This is to be considered, in a way, a compliment. You're serving the Lord, and you're being able to experience a bit of his sufferings with him, to understand the price he paid for you, to love him all the more, and to show the world the victory that comes in that name, Yeshua Jesus. First Kepha, First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter now talking to the people. So it's not just Paul saying it. We've got two witnesses, two men that we highly respect in the early beginnings of what we call the church. He says, Beloved, who does Kepha love? He loves his fellow brethren. We call each other beloved. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. In other words, when you're suffering persecution, don't go, huh, what's wrong? I shouldn't be suffering persecution. Everything should be a utopia. I should be living in the land of Pollyanna. Everything should be great. No. Realize, persecution will tell you, you are on the right track for the Lord. You are doing right. Don't think it, it's a surprise, but realize victory comes in the Lord. He's not going to let you go through it alone, and he's not going to let you be defeated. Scripture after scripture after scripture will tell you that. The Hebrew name for Andromeda is Sarah, which means the chained. And this brightest star in her head means the broken down. So we see that she's breaking down. In the body, the Hebrew word is marach, and it means weak, the star that, that's in her body. In her foot, it's a Hebrew word that means struck down. And the other stars are afflicted and weak. So we do see her chained and hurt. We see arrows, and, and we see, read chapter 11 of Hebrews. Read the persecutions that they went through. Oh, my goodness. I mean, Hebrews 11. The chapter of faith. I thought that, yeah, that was the faith chapter. Yeah, yeah. But, but look what, see, their faith overcame. They suffered persecution, but their faith overcame. No matter what they suffered. I'm calling up, uh, the first part of, um, of 11 is all about different people and their faith, okay? And it tells about these different ones. But let me just for short say, um, and by the way, verse 13 tells us they died in faith without receiving the promises. They knew the promises were still coming. That could be true for us today too, but it may not be because we could be raptured. Uh, and it tells again, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, it, it names all these, Moshe, Moses. Um, but what I'm getting at is, starts with about, okay, about around verse 32 this chapter. Time doesn't, let me tell you, Gideon. Barak, Samson, um, Jephthah, Dan, David, Samuel, I'm trying to say the names just in English quick. Okay. Who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises. Now here you go. Shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, not accepting the release that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings, floggings, chains, imprisonment, stone, sawn in two, tempted, put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins. That means rough and uh, poor. They weren't wealthy and, and living in comfort. They were destitute, afflicted, tormented. The world isn't even worthy of them. They wandered in deserts on mountains, sheltering in caves and holes. They all, having gained approval through their faith, 
did not receive what was promised before their death, but they came into it after, and they will have it for all of eternity. That's what we're talking about. Yes, the woman is, is warm. Yes, she's afflicted. Yes, she suffers being tortured and all of these things happening. But it's not over. It's not the final. Those chains are going to be broken, and she is going to be freed, and we will see that. The picture also of the captive daughter of Zion, of Zion. I want to bring that out. The king is going to redeem Zion. What I'm talking about is when Jerusalem is referred to as the daughter of Jerusalem. I see this in Andromeda also. Um, what we're seeing is the one who is going to rescue Israel is the one who also rescues us in our spiritual salvation. Uh, but again, remember the promises to the land of Israel that she will receive because God unconditionally promised it to her. He promised to sit on the throne on earth and rule, and there would be a thousand years of peace. That will come. That's when the king does redeem. Um, look with me at Yeshia, Isaiah 51. I want you to see that I can back up what I say. Isaiah 51. And we're going to look at verse 21. There we go. We're going to go into chapter 52 also. Isaiah 51, verse 21. Therefore, listen to this, you afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. That is what you, your Lord, the Lord your God, who contends for his people, says. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the chalice of my anger. You will never drink it again. I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, Lie down so we may walk over you. You have also made your back like the ground and like the street for those who walk over it. This is referring to Israel who is suffering persecution because she has been out of fellowship with the Lord. And she's brought herself into captivity. She's brought these things upon herself. But the Lord says it's not going to stay that way. Chapter 52, awake, awake, clothe yourself in your strength, Zion. Clothe yourself with your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, the holy city for the uncircumcised and the unclean. That's the heathen. The not, it doesn't mean every Gentile. It means the unbelieving ones who will, will no longer come upon you or into you. I'm sorry. Shake yourself from the dust. Rise up, captive <coughs> Jerusalem. Release yourself from the chains around your neck. Now, we see the chains on our hands and feet, but we can apply it. Captive daughter of Zion. We see that she is going to have a victory here. This is what the Lord says, verse 3. You were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed. How? Without money. money. <coughs> they didn't buy their redemption. They were redeemed by the free shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, who is their Messiah, who came the first time. We saw him in the first four signs. He came for the redeemed. We're seeing in these four signs, and he will come back to be in his glory, victor, in the last four signs. So here is a great summary of that, of captive Yerushalayim, who will be... Um, um, brought free, made free, however I should say that, mm -hmm. by Yeshua Jesus, who will set her free. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the next book, chapter 14, verse 17 says, You will say this word to them, Let my eyes stream down tears night and day. Let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people has been crushed with a mighty blow, with a sorely infl inflicted wound. That could be Andromeda here. We could see that but she will be broken, brought free, and she will receive all that God has promised her. Why? Because she's good? No. Because he's good. Because he is faithful. Romans 8 and verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Yeshua, I'm sorry, in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, has set you free from the law of sin and death. What are the chains that really bind? Sin and death. And the Lord has broken those chains for all of us. Let's read that in Galatians 3 and see. It's not just promises that are given to Israel, but it's promises to the Gentiles who are grafted in also. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 say, Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that, verse 14, key, in order that in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, 
the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Because the Jewish people stumbled at his first coming, God opened that for the Gentiles to be grafted in to provoke jealousy with the Jewish people, not to cut them off, but to bring in the, this people also to come into the promises received through the Spirit uh, in spirituality and, and for Israel to go on and receive later physically as well. This is what we're seeing in these verses. So Israel and the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, I'll put it that way, both um, come in to receive their blessings. Let me give you some other verses. Yochanan, John 16 and verse 33. John 16 and verse 33, we read... Whoops, 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 I went too far. Okay, 1633, Yeshua Jesus speaking, These things have I spoken to you, so that in me you may have shalom, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. He didn't say in the world you've got it made. He says in the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. If you need help, you want someone that's been through that battle, that knows how to, to win that battle, don't you? That's where you're going to gravitate. You're going to go to someone who can help you with the same problem that they had and they got victory. That's our Lord. No matter what the battle, He has fought it. He has gotten victory. He shares that freely with all of us. Romans 8, 28. He works all things together for good to those who love Him, those who are called according to His purpose. Go with me back to keep again. 1 Peter chapter 4. I think that's where we were before, but this time we're going to look at verse 13. Whoops, 1 Peter 4 and verse 13. And we read in verse 13, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Messiah, I think we've said it well, you know you're going to suffer just like Christ suffered. But to the degree that that happens, keep on rejoicing, so that the revelation of his glory, at, I'm sorry, at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice and be overjoyed. What it's saying in another verse that will come up later, I thought it was this one, it's telling us that you suffer with Christ, you'll reign with Christ, that we will see the victory and we will receive all of our blessings. I'm sure that will pop up for me at a later point because I thought it was this verse. But anyway, if you suffer with the Lord, you'll have glory with the Lord also. He'll bring you through victoriously. Pardon me to the Zoom audience, but my real audience, are you too warm? Do you need a little bit of air? Doing okay? Doing okay? Okay. All right. We'll go on. I, I don't want anybody fainting on my watch. <laughs> okay. I brought a sweater because I don't get hot. They do. I understand. <laughs> I'm that way too. We'll look now at Cepheus. Cepheus is going up just a little bit from and and Andromeda. I have to think how to say the name. We want to see the one with the crown. He's almost in the middle, Roger. Um, He's, he's right here. I don't know which way to hold it. Yeah, there you go. You found him fast. Okay. Cepheus, I, I'm probably saying his name totally wrong. This is the king. The picture in this one is the redeemer that's coming to rule. I've been promising you that's what's coming. We will begin to see it. This is the crown king. The, their redeemer is coming to rule. There are 35 stars that make up this I don't know how many made up Andromeda. My source didn't say, and I didn't get an answer to the question asked last week either. The sources don't always tell us the numbers. <laughs> uh, but there's 35 in this one. It is a king crown, and throne with the scepter in his hand. You can see that in both pictures well. 35 stars? Ooh. Yes. Yeah. And his foot is planted on the polar star. That's why you see in the picture on the left, you see that star in the foot that's really being shown. Okay? If you don't remember the polar star, I'll tell you about it in a moment. But let me just say right now, over all that's showing, he's ruling the world. Let me read to you in Scripture how we know that this is coming. We all know that we see it in Revelation 19 when he comes back and stops the battle of Armageddon, sets up his, um, his kingdom for that thousand years of peace. But I'm going to take you to um, original covenant, what you call Old Testament, to prophecies that show this also. One trillion stars in Andromeda. 
One, two, one trillion. There might be the whole galaxy they're talking about. Too. It's got to be, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's too that's, many in, in just Andromeda alone. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's hard. Some of the sources, you have to find where they yeah. agree. Because um, not everything is just black and white. So you don't really see that. You diamond. see it. You see it just with the outlines. Yes. Um, that don't look like a king. That's what I'm saying. It, look that's like number three. it doesn't to us at all. That's the. Yes. That's king. number number three. Number Cepheus three. the king, because um, Loretta <coughs> brought that question up. But we don't see that shape, especially like right now. What you see for Cepheus, you they made the crown, the head look like it's you know the glory. Um, okay, like right, right. But how do we get those pictures? Let me tell you about Cepheus, then I'll go back and I'll tell you about those pictures again because I found out a little more information of where they came from. Although, remember, the pictures are not inerrant. The Word of God yeah. is, but the pictures yeah. aren't. But it helps us understand, and we'll see how that's been passed down. I'll give that to you um, in a moment. Let's do Cepheus first. And Roger, when I do... The two pictures that I want you to bring up are the very last two on that flash drive. Okay. They're like 53 and 54, something like that. Or I think I labeled them A and B so that okay, they yeah, would stand out. Yeah, Perfect. okay, those are the two we're going to want to admit. But let's look at Cepheus first, okay? Let's look at him rolling. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. 12 says, Then say to him, The Lord of armies, Adonai Sabaot. The Lord of armies, armies says this, Behold, there is a man, and in my Bible, a man is capitalized. That's correct, it should be. This is not just a normal man. This is the man who is the Son of God. This is the man who is God himself. What chapter again? Zechariah 6, oh, verses okay. 12 and 13. Behold, there is a man whose name is the branch. That's Samach. That's our ministry name that you hear. That's the smock means a branch, the branch that springs forth and fills the face of the earth. And this is what the branch will do. And by the way, Isaiah 11, 1 tells us that out of the, the root of Jesse, the branch would spring forth, okay? The Isaiah rod that what? comes forth. Isaiah 11 and verse 1 is your cross reference there. Okay, so the branch, he will branch out from where he is. He will build the temple of the Lord. We know in the millennial, millennial kingdom, I really can't talk today. In the millennial kingdom, we know that the Lord will rule and reign from Jerusalem on earth. This is referring to that. He will build the temple of the Lord. It's a huge temple. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the majesty and sit and rule on his throne so that he will be a priest on his throne because he's done the priestly duties for us, the, the, the shedding of blood, the forgiveness of sin. And he will be the council of shalom. He will be the judge that, that rules and that brings peace. And the, the power will be between those two offices. You had your ruling authority in the tribe of Judah. You had your priestly authority in the tribe of Levi. You didn't have the two in one until you have Messiah, who not only was um, priest and king, but also prophet, the great prophet, the one that was promised fulfilling all prophecy. So in this one, the branch who will spring forth and fill the face of the earth, he is prophet, he is priest, he is king, he is worthy of that crown on his head. Go to um, chapter 14 in the book of Zechariah. You're in 6, go over to chapter 14. And go to verse 9, and there we read, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name the only one. Zechariah 14, verse 9. 1 or 9? 14, verse 9. Yeah, verse 9. Okay, so that's Cepheus. That's our crowned king who is going to rule over all the earth. That's, now, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Yeshua, Jesus. That's our Lord. That's our Savior. That's our Messiah. That's the Lamb of God. That's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. How many more names do you want? <laughs> I can go on and on. That's who we're talking about. And I can hardly wait till this world sees him ruling and reigning in authority, bringing that shalom. We know that Satan is bound time and we know that peace does fill the face of the earth that's going to be amazing in itself now here's the very very interesting thing if you don't remember that polar star remember the polar star even though we think it's fixed 
it really has slowly moved through time. Do you remember where it was before? If you don't, I'll remind you. It was in Draco the Dragon. It was in his head. I think it was the eye of Draco the Dragon showing that he was the ruler of the world. He was the one controlling. We know he is. Ephesians 6 says he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the one we have to reckon with today. Even though we are redeemed, he's why we feel and, and really are still bound from receiving all of our blessings yet. Okay? That's where the polar star was, was in Draco the dragon. We're actually going to study more of Draco the dragon in the future. Roger's showing you here on the chart. Good for him. But we'll talk about him more later. The point is, when the king is ruling, the polar star is in the foot of the king. Not in Draco the dragon anymore. He's in the foot of the king. Now, remember how God said, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool? The yeah. foot is showing everything is in subjection under him. Guess where the polar star is now? It's no longer in Draco. It's already in Cepheus when it's seen in the sky. So we must be that close to his coming to rule and to reign. I don't believe it could be thousands of years off again because no. the polar star would keep moving and that star would be out of his foot. But right now it's lined up right where it ought to be. And when you look through the scope of time, it's very hard to see a little bit of overlap there. I can see how the polar star can appear in his foot and, and we're lining up exactly with it. It doesn't mean that we've missed it. It means we're coming into it. The same way that you think you're driving to a mountain and that mountain looks so close and you think you're going to touch that mountain but it takes you another 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever to drive into it. Yeah. That same idea. That's what I'm saying. But that excites the daylights out of me. The polar star has moved from being in Satan's domain to being under the foot of our reigning king. And I say, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dora, what's your question? Uh, I was going to ask, and where was Draco? Where did it start? Uh, Draco it on the map, where did you find it, Roger? Is it in the middle or is it down below? I forget which. He's in the middle. He's in the, middle. Yeah. He's in the very middle. He's all squeakly because he's like a serpent or a dragon. He's right in the middle. Okay, okay. That's Draco. Okay, and we will study Draco. I don't remember which one that he comes under. I passed out to you five and six. Here we go. I can find Draco real fast. You can't miss him. He's pretty good size. Yeah, yeah it's under three. Just keep going. Maybe we already did talk about him. We messed up when I brought yeah. it out before because he's not. Oh, we're yeah, going we'll to see him anyway. We're going to see him defeated, but he's not one of our major. Okay, here we go. Who was Draco under? Scorpio. I'm missing a page. So Scorpio then. I think it was under Scorpio. I think that was because Scorpio is the serpent, is yeah. the, the um, scorpion that, that kills, you know, right. that's put into feet. I think that was when we studied Draco. I think you remember right. Good for you, Roger. Um, and thank you for pulling me back on track. <laughs> anyway, we'll still talk about Satan's defeat. We're going to see him defeated. We're going to see the Lord ruling and reigning. But I love this. Here it is, it's all lined up, ready to go. Was the Sagittarius? I should have all my yeah. notes in front of us. Okay. Could be. Could be. Okay, and see, I don't have page two in front of me. So, and you know, I've brought the, all those pages every week till now and decided I didn't need to bring them down today. You never know. <laughs> That's the way it always goes. I had so many pages I didn't want to get confused, but yeah, I definitely left it upstairs. Oh, unless it's. Nope, that's my review. It's upstairs. Sorry, folks. Anyway, whichever sign Draco was under, I think um, because... Sagittarius? It is Sagittarius. Okay. Okay, even though it fit with Scorpion. The archer. <laughs> the archer. The archer that wins. Okay, that's where we studied Draco. He's brought down. He goes down in defeat. Forgive me for not remembering, um, but there's a whole lot. I'm studying what I'm teaching. I'm studying ahead to be ready for you, and I have to keep reviewing, and I don't hold it all yet, so... We're learning together, and I'm not ashamed to say that I don't know it all. <laughs> anyway, what I do know is that Hebrews 1.13, let me, let me give it to you from Scripture. This is where I see Cephas giving us a picture of this. Hebrews chapter 1, 
and verse 13 says, But to which of the angels has he, God, Jehovah, ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? He never said to the angels, but he said it to the one who is equal with him, the one Son of God, very God himself. That's who he said it to. He said it to him uh, after his coming down in human form to do what he has done for us. Now sit here and wait. And when all your enemies are put under your feet, the last being uh, sin and death, which we'll see put under his feet, that's when the role um, we see King, Kings, Lord, Lords, starts with the millennial reign, but will go on forever. We'll have that one little... I can't call it a hiccup, but that interruption when Satan is loosed for a short time, only to bring together all those whose heart really is with Satan and not with the Lord, and they will be cast into the lake of fire forever at the end of that time. If you don't know what I'm talking about, that's uh, at the Great White Throne Judgment, and that's after the Millennial Rule. It's Gog and Magog. There's a whole lot there. See me. I'll direct you to another teaching or share it with you when we have time for that. But most of you, I think, know the layout of God's plan, and that's coming in the future. But here we go. Cephas, um, the Greek name, comes from the Hebrew, which is Samach. I already told you the Hebrew name is Samach. It means the royal branch. The ancient Egyptian, Egyptian zodiac named him this one comes to rule and that fits he's coming to rule he's wearing the crown he is coming to rule the stars in the constellation in the right shoulder in, in english means coming quickly the star in his girdle means the redeemer and the star in the left knee means who bruises or breaks remember he was bruised for us but he broke Satan, crushed him, killed him. Satan bruised his heel. He gave his, Satan's head the death blow. So we see all of this in the names of um, Cepheus' the stars. Now, among the ancients, Pisces was considered the most unfavorable of all the signs. The least that they'd want to be you know, in relation to. The astrological calendars describe Pisces as an emblem indicative of violence and death. The hieroglyphics of Egypt, the fish, is a symbol that's odious. Yeah. <laughs> he is not odious, but he scared the daylights out. I know, he popped right in front of you. Hello, sweetheart. <laughs> I thought you were going to the cubby hole. Right? Yeah, he could go in the cubby hole. That would be fine, but I think I'll try up here and see if he'll be good for me. <laughs> Sorry, folks. This is what happens when we zoom at home, okay? <laughs> oh, he loves me and I love him. Um, okay, all right, so the Egyptian, um, their way of looking at fish was odious. They, that, that was disliked, it was hatred, nothing good is said about it. Now remember we said it earlier, Pisces was in relation to Israel's history? What is her history? Is she not looked on by the world as an yeah. odious people? Yeah. Has not her history been full of violence and death? Do we not see all of these things and understand? And I think we could even put the church in there. The church is hated by the world. The church, the world thinks the church stinks, and they think they're foolish, and they want nothing to do with them and not associate with them. They're hated by the world also. Matthew 24, 9. And I'm not done. I'm pausing to get my scripture up here. But Matthew 24 and verse 9, because I'm not leaving it on this note, no worries. Then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. Who said that? Jesus. Jesus, Yeshua Jesus, that's what he's saying. They're going to hate you because of my name. Luke 6, we're not promised an easy life down here. We're not promised a bed of roses. But like my dad used to say, but who can go to sleep on a bed of thorns? Luke what? Luke 6, verse 22. Blessed are you when the people hate you, when they exclude you, when they insult you, when they scorn your name as evil. Why? On account of the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Yeshua Jesus, high and lifted up. 
Rejoice on that day. Jump for joy. Why? Because you're suffering? No, no, because your reward is great in heaven. And it goes on from there. Okay, the Lord promises victory, promises a great reward. We know that those who suffer martyrdom are given a crown of life. You know, it, it ends on a wonderful note. But I find it very interesting also. Remember, the early <coughs> believers took on the sign of the fish. They took that on as a symbol of Christianity for us to this day. I think it's very fitting. Something that the world hated and found putrid, but something that the Lord said, He'd make us fishers of men. He saw it in a good light, and he sees it bringing us into the glories that he says, your suffering here isn't even worth being compared to the glories that I have for you in heaven. No matter how bad you think it is, when you see the glories that are yours, you're going to say, oh, that that I suffered down there, that was nothing compared to this. Hallelujah. I learned uh, from uh, China, uh, the, uh, the house churches, the pastors, when they become Christians, they started back in uh, 1933. They're, when they come, they know they're going to be modern. And, and, but they're, they've made up their mind. And, and the missionary says, is America going to really stand and go through the persecution and be modern like there's China, you know, and he's been a missionary there for over 25 years, and he said, they're loyal. Mm -hmm. And even the communist really comes in and takes the pastor. The uh, the people of the church stand Step, yes, with yes. prayer. They know yeah, it's the, the life of Christ. Yeah. No and changes. America as a whole will not. Individuals, I believe, will. But as a whole, we know our country is turning from what God calls us to. Church of China is a huge church. It grows like wildfire. Why? Because of the persecution. I believe that God just really blesses and brings them through that. Pray for those <clears throat> because they are suffering persecution to this day. India is the same way. I have a friend that has family and, and many relatives in India who told us less than a month ago of the martyrdom of a number of pastors who were killed in front of their families on purpose to, to destroy the family. And yet, like Loretta says, the church goes on. Even when the, that leader is taken out and martyrdom, they go on with the Lord. They are, they, they do stand faithful and they will, great will be the reward. Um, we have it so easy we, and we complain, God forgive us. Okay, <clears throat> now before I go into the sign of Aries, I want to read to you a little bit of how we get these constellation shapes that I came across it that tell it a little better. I've explained to you before that there's, there's the findings, we go back into ancient findings for the meaning of the names and all of that, but we also have some pictures that, that help us understand. What I want to bring to you is that there are ancient, and I'm going to call them star charts, okay? We've got a chart here. There are ancient star charts. Sometimes they're called planispheres, um, you know, the planets and all that. They show the constellations in their shapes and names that were once common knowledge at that time. It's been lost just as a whole today. We know some, but not all. But they show some of those shapes. This is what I think will help us understand. So let me give you an example. I'm going to be teaching us about Taurus the bull soon. We know the name Taurus. In ancient language, it was Ra'im. Ra that's the, the Hebrew for it. Orion is mentioned in Job. We're going to see Orion in that, but it, that name stayed the same, okay? Taurus's name changed to something more modern, but back in ancient time, it would, would have been called Re'im, okay? In, their, in a cave art, this was found in a cave in France. I don't know how to pronounce it. L-A-S-C-A-U-X. Le, Le Creux, something like that. I'm sorry, there's no R in there. Le Coup, Le Caux. I don't know how to say in this cave in France, and Roger's going to bring up, it's at the very end, or either go for A or go for the last two slides, okay. last two pictures. That was found um, dating back to 3000 or 2900 BC. It had the shapes on this carving. There you go. There you go. Okay, pull that up. I saw the shirt. Oh, okay, only you've got the wrong picture. You got pursuous. You started out good and you slipped. 
Oh. There you go. Okay, mm -hmm. now share it. That's the bowl. <laughs> you, you keep slipping. So I'm now sure. it goes I know, that so way. I'm not sure what it... Okay, this is another oh, I one. I can sh leave this one up for a minute since you've got it. Share okay. it. This is called um, a relief that the type of artwork it is. This relief is um, John H. Rogers it is the one credited with, I don't know if he found it or what, but it's the only complete map of the ancient sky that, is, that they still have. And when you see that, if you can study that for a minute, you begin to see the shapes that we see in our chart today. Okay, wow. that, that goes back, do I have the date on this one? Um, I thought wow. I did. It's now on display in a museum in Paris. Um, yeah, I really thought I had the age of it. it. It's ancient also. I'll work on getting you the age of it. Um, you know why they call it relief? If I can, because of the type of artwork it is. Oh, I thought it was because he was finished with it. He was relieved. <laughs> he didn't do it. He didn't make it. So no, Roger's making a joke. Oh, he was relieved because he finished. No, but they call that type of work in, in the bronze, they call it relief. Okay, let me go back to the one before it, if you can get it, the, the one just before that you're trying to pull up. That's the one in this cave that I told you, um, that's 3000 BC, there you go, or 2900. It shows the blue course is what's been drawn to help us see, but you can see the shape of the bowl there. That was, the, you know, they just showed us one part. See how it says map 5.8? That's showing you Taurus. Each one will be shown. You can see Orion down below. It's hard to see. But you can begin to see how they had shapes there. That's what's been passed down to us. So it isn't that in 2000 AD we suddenly decided to say, oh, Taurus is a bull. No, they carried that down from these, these findings that were there before. There are Mesopotamian tablets dating to 1800 B.C., they record both the names and the observation of the moves of the planets in these ancient records. Babylonian Chaldean tablets from 800 to 600 BC, they named the primary constellations the same way we named them. Um, they found material from 2,000 years ago in Arabia. Again, the constellations match the same shapes and names that we have today. So this is how that's come down. But it does say, and this is the part that was new to me and I found very interesting. It says, what was common knowledge in that ancient world began to fade about the time when B.C. became A.D. To prevent the loss of the star story, there were several people who worked to preserve the stars and the constellation names. Arguably, one of the most significant works to preserve the ancient star and constellation names was done by Ptolemy. P.T., you know, Ptolemy in his, and it's called Amalgust. That's dated to 150 A.D. So he made record in 150 A.D. saying this is starting to get lost. I don't want it to get lost. In it, he described the positions of each ancient constellation and the stars with remarkable accuracy, making it very easy for us to trace today. So I think a lot of what we take comes from Ptolemy's work of 150 A.D. He knew what was older, the B.C. things were getting lost, and he was one of the few who put it down. He listed the 48 original constellations that we're studying, the 12 major and the 3 minor under each one, and he gave us 1,022 of the names of the stars, which we bring the meanings from for today. So that begins to show you how it passed down and even more than, than I had realized. I didn't know about Ptolemy and his work. The, the relief, John H. Rogers' relief, is Egyptian. Um, it, it was found in the Hathor Temple at Dendera. Okay, the, for anybody who knows ancient Egypt. Um, but I can't find, I, I, somehow I missed the year. I'll see if I can find out how old that is and bring it next week to you. But that begins to help us understand how these pictures came on down. And again, the pictures, remember sometimes we said it looks like an animal. If you want to make it one kind of an animal or another, it doesn't matter. But when we go to the names, it helps us know what we're looking at and what the shape should be like. So like when we get to the bull, we're going to see that's not just a bull standing in the field. This is a charging bull. And we know the Lord comes back. 
rule, you know, comes, takes charge to rule and to reign, that's under the sign of Taurus. So we'll see how it fits in by the names and their meanings as well as those shapes that were given. With all of that in mind, I think we can go back to our study. It just it kind of shores us up for what we're studying today. Again, it shows one thing. Anne and I are the bull, so we're going to come charging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and again, remember, we know the Word of God is inerrant. I believe God even let this fade because we had the Word of God because we weren't dependent on the stars to tell the story. But when God gave it to Abraham, when he showed it, I believe, to Enoch and Yov, Job, and others at that time also, that was the book they could read. That was what was available for and them. And the wise men, they used it. And the wise too. men used it, yes. It was passed down, I believe, from Daniel's time with them. But, you know, I, just, I can just see God just doing it. You know, showing them their, the handiwork and the stars they would see. It wasn't a time of pollution. It wasn't a time of uh, city lights and all. I mean, they saw stars that we've probably never seen, you know, and I could just see God teaching and teaching. And then, of course, your shepherds studying the stars. They're passing down the genealogy to the children, the heritage of how they're to follow their holy days. They could be telling them, look, see what you see now. We know in the midst of those stars, when the Lord came in his first coming, he stepped out of that in essence. And what we have is the angels come and declare the glory of God, which we know is Yeshua Jesus. Where did those angels come? Where did they appear? In the sky, in the night sky. And when we get into Aries, if we get there, we might get there. Let's start. There's something really cool there. Yeah, I think we I think we will get to this because it's my very next thing up and it's only 309. Yeah. So I love this, what's coming up. It, it excites me like that polar star excites me. We're looking now at the sign of Aries. Roger's already pulled it up. This is the ram or a male lamb. Aries is also a picture of the chief or the head. Um, and it is the blessings of the redeemed. Now it's not in abeyance. Now it's not on hold. The blessings of the redeemed consummated and enjoyed. So we're moving from the time when, when we're still bound to this earth and not receiving our full blessings. We're going to move into a time where we're going to see that we receive those full blessings. Even though we still haven't come quite yet to our last set of four, we're getting close. Um, and that will be all the victory. Aries is number eight. Right next yes, to Pisces. number eight, right next to Pisces, um, in front of the bull. Okay, Roger's got it up there, and I'm showing you here on the chart for those of you who need it on the chart. Okay, Aries is like sitting in front of the bull. Oh, he's, he's sitting on him. Sitting <laughs> on him. Um, he's got his foot on the band. Remember, we studied the band in Pisces. And just below him is Cetus, the sea monster that's going to go totally down in feet <laughs> down in the sea all the way down in the, the sea <laughs> okay he's the one, he's the one outside the circle the he's circle on the elliptic eight. he's is, on the elliptic is he number eight yes he's number eight he's small do you see him on the yeah. elliptic see this is below the circle yes yes because he's, he's going down he's going down where he's not even going to be seen soon oh okay yeah yeah but um, I thought you meant Aries. Aries is just above him. Okay? So, Aries is 66 stars. It is, the description is he is prepared for victory. Remember Capricorn? And that's my two that I wanted to, to our start and our finish. It is. I've got it now. Thank you, Lord. Capricorn is how we opened the second series we have. Remember, we take our major 12. We divide them into the first major book which is Messiah in his sufferings. Then we have our second set of four, which is the redeemed that uh, is the result of who he died for. And then we're going to move into numbers 9 through 12. We're going to look at the last four, the Messiah in his second coming, all about his glory, ruling, and reigning. Okay? In this middle, we're, we're match, matching bookends. We've got our two animals of sacrifice. We have Capricorn that had the, the head of the goat, but it was bowed down as if being slain. We now have Aries, the ram or the lamb, which we know 
Avraham, the ram, was caught in the thicket and gave its life in place of Yitzhak. We know the Messiah came as the Lamb of God who was not substituted. He didn't substitute out. He took on. He became slain for us. Death burial, but resurrection, newness of life. And that, remember the fish with the, um, the going up. Remember in the middle between the two animals that show us sacrifice are the, the ones that show us people, the fishies. They had to do with fish, fish we've seen as people. So again, we're seeing he sacrificed his life. He's pictured by a ram, he's pictured by a goat. And remember the goat was the picture of Day of Atonement to win a people, the redeemed people, to win victory for us and bring us into the blessings that will be ours. So here we go. This ram is full of vigor and life. He's not falling in death like Capricornus. This is Revelation 5 and verse 12. Do you all remember who studied Revelation with me? Yeah. One of my favorite chapters. I love it all, though. Chapter 5 and verse 12. This is, and I have to back you up to verse 11 so you know who's speaking. Yochanan, John is given a heavenly vision. He is not looking on earth. He is looking in heaven. He looked, he heard the voices of many angels around the throne. And he saw the living creatures. There's four living creatures. He saw the elders. How many elders? Twelve. Try again. Twenty-four. 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 Oh, yeah, right. Okay, twenty-four. Picture of the church family. Twelve would be a picture of just Israel. Now we see the, the fuller. Twelve, we see a complete Jew and Gentile for salvation. Anyway, the number of them. Okay, so the voices of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them, the number of these angels, myriads of myriads. That means more than thousands of thousands. That means more than millions of millions. Can you imagine how huge heaven is, how big it is to be in his throne room, and if all layers, those angels, layers, layers. yeah, I mean, wow, 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 wow. And what are they all saying? I love it. They are saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, Blessing. Ooh. Hallelujah. That's what they are saying. They are witnessing to the, the, the Lamb who was slain, who is now being raised up, worthy of all this glory, receiving all of this, all that, that should be His. There goes a huge bug. Oh, my word. Okay. I don't have shoes. Okay. I, don't I have do, shoes. and it's too late. I should have jumped. Okay, that's a lot of bad. We've been. I thought your cat would catch it, but it just rolled on it. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, folks. Satan's throwing everything he can at this class. He's not getting the victory. There won't be any bugs, creepy, crawly, yucky things when we get out of the curse of this world. When God made them, yes, it was. I agree. <laughs> Creep me out, Laura. When, uh, when God made this world, those weren't creepy. They weren't, they didn't give us girls wooly <laughs> feelings. Sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you because I want to get rid of it. I do not want it left in the house. <laughs> they can live outdoors, not in the house. <laughs> okay. Anyway, back on track. We are looking at a wonderful scene. We are looking at the lamb who has been slain. Not the lamb who is slain. Not the lamb who is to be slain. This is the Lamb who was. Victory has come. This is the one who is risen in that, that newness of life that he promises us. This is the one who is worthy to receive all that we just said. In our view, he is lying in with composure. It's supposed to be the look on his face. He's gazing at the field. I think he's gazing at the souls that he has redeemed. Just my idea. But... The names for him, for the stars that make up, the 66 stars that make up Aries, uh, one means the lamb, the other means the sheep, gentle and merciful. The Syriac name we find also for the lamb. So we have it in Hebrew, we have it in Arabic, and we have it in Syriac, and they all say that it means the lamb. 
That takes us to Yochanan John 1, 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So even if he looks more like a ram, I think of him more as the lamb. The stars in him in his forehead mean wounded or slain. We know that to be true. He was wounded for our transgressions. Isaiah, Yeshua 53. His left horn, which makes him male, his left horn means the bruised or the wounded. He was bruised for us. He was wounded for us. The Hebrew that we come to, the name means the bound. He was bound to the cross for us to pay that punishment for our sins. Now here's what I, I love. This is what I find fascinating. It is said that the sun entered Aries on the 14th of Nisan. Is that a familiar date to those of you who have been around with me? The 14th of Nisan is... What Jewish holiday? Holy day. Oh, the, the Passover. The Passover. Very good. The 14th of Nisan is the day that the lamb would be slain. This was true of the sun entering Aries. They believe at the time of the Exodus, and at the, which was the first Passover. Okay? Now, how can they get that? Because the sun is orderly. It takes 12 months to go through its elliptical path. It doesn't take 13 months one time and seven months another time. It takes the 12 months, and it's orderly. So if it's in Nissan today, it was in Nissan back then. That's how we can know the orderliness of it. The same way they can know like a comet that comes and when it will come again. That is that orderly. Okay, so, and in English is what? Nissan. The lamp. No, no, but I mean Nissan. the 14th of Nissan. Oh, 14th of Nissan is is March or April on our calendar. Oh, okay. okay, it changes all the time, so I can't give you an exact date, but it would be when Passover is. It would be okay. on the day that the lambs were slain. Uh -huh. On the 10th, they yeah. were picked out. On the 14th, they were slain. And that would okay? be, always be before Easter, wouldn't it? Uh, Usually, Easter is at, should be at that time. Yeah. Truly, Easter is. Passover. Yeah, so yeah. it's, it, well, it, it's the resurrection. It's three days after, okay, mm -hmm. to be exact. Because we always make Easter on a Sunday. I love to call it Resurrection Day, by the way, even though the true meaning of Easter is not the connotation a lot of people think. But the day of resurrection we know was three days after. You have Passover, you have that, the first fruits that were at that time, and then you have that third day, the day of resurrection. So when, when on the English calendar, Easter comes at the same time as Passover, you're in good form. That's how it was originally, okay? But here's my point right now. By the time of the crucifixion, because of the precision, precision sorry, of the equinox, the sun would recede to where on Nisan 14, it stood at the very spot marked by the stars in Aries that mean the pierced, the wounded, the slain. That's where the sun would have been, okay? It would have been right there. Um, I'm imagining probably around Aries' head. But here's where we go a little bit further. Let me bring out this. Let me, let me say this. Keep that thought because that's part one. I'm going to say part two in just a moment. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, because this is how exact our God is. But... When the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Did you catch the beginning of that? In the fullness of time. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Okay? When was the fullness of time? When it happened. God knew he had the time mapped out from before the foundations of the world because he planned crucifixion, death, death burial, and resurrection before the foundation of the world. We're told that, that he died for us before he created the world. Okay, so God has his perfect timing. In that perfect timing, in that fullness of time, not a year early, not a year late, not a day early and not a day late, right at that time, this is when he came so that he would be crucified at this time, death, burial, and resurrection. So, at this very time, in the fullness of time, and let me give you also Romans 5, 6. <clears throat> and if you cannot hear because the air just came on, someone wave me and let me know. We'll do something about it. 
Romans 5, 6, while we were still helpless at the right time, Messiah died for the ungodly. So the fullness of time was dependent fully on God. Not because we got to a point, we got it right, we were doing it right, and now we came. No, this was all on God, his faithfulness, and his perfect plan. So in the supernatural darkness that took place on the day, we call it the day of Calvary, okay, the day that he's dying on the cross. Remember Matthew 27, 45, and I'll read it for you so you know I'm not making it up. Matthew 27 and verse 45. At this time, we've got um, the crucifixion going on from about verse 43 on. Whoops, my tablet keeps moving. Okay, now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. This was daytime hours. There was darkness on the land like it was nighttime. We're told that from about noon to about three would be the sixth hour to the ninth hour, okay? The sun normally would be overhead. It normally would be right. If they had seen the sun, it was in Aries. It was right around those stars that are saying the wounded, the slain, the pierced. So if the sun it can't be seen, and I cannot tell you whether they could see the stars or not, but if they could see those stars in that darkness, and maybe they did, maybe it showed them, those are the very stars they would have seen when Messiah was dying on the cross in the face or the, the body, the, the constellation, I'll put it that way, in the constellation of the Lamb. But not just the Lamb that's going down at the feet, the Lamb that shows as if it's been slain, the Lamb that shows victory. So at that very hour, they would, the stars were witnessing for the millennium of time what was taking place. Is that not exacting of our God and is that not amazing? And I can't wait till I can get home to heaven and ask, could they see those stars? Could it be that those who were in the know of the stars would have known what they were looking at? Would the, the majority know? The majority weren't spent students of the stars and wouldn't have had that knowledge. But it's another proof of the authority of God, of his word, of the word of God, of the exactness to the nth degree. I just see the hand of God. And that just excites me. It blows me away and it makes me think, wow, what an ineffable, my favorite word, God we have that could orchestrate it so perfectly. Is that not amazing? It's really awesome, awesome. It is awesome. What I'm trying to decide is if I go on or if I stop this right here. I think I'll go on because it's just 325. Give me till at least 330. That's a highlight. We've had a couple highlights. We've got the polar star. We've got the king of kings in the polar star showing that, that he is the ruler over the world now. And we see this timing of his first coming so perfectly. That tells me that coming of that second coming is as precisely perfect also. Scripture tells us he said if he didn't come back when he does in the second coming, there wouldn't even be any flesh left alive. A couple hundred years ago, people wondered, how could that be? With nuclear technology today, nobody questions how the whole world could be wiped out. One country throwing one bomb, another throwing another, the outfall everywhere, we could easily see how all flesh could be destroyed. That God, in the fullness of time, came the first time, and in the fullness of time will come the second time. They're showing now there's sinkholes where in Florida, the water, is he, the buildings are falling in and there was a man in his bedroom the whole bedroom went into a hole they never did find him mm -hmm. so they're safe from this big pond in florida um, where the water is under the the uh the state there and long as it's the same thing yeah well god god's at work in a nature he's in control of it all yeah it's just really strange how god is working that out and i think so much of those tribulation signs that we study and when it talks about even the stars, you know, that will be falling out of the sky at that time and all that will be happening, I believe it's all fitting into what God is telling. It's yeah. just, I, I find it amazing. Let's look at Cassiopeia. She's the first uh, of the small constellations under Aries. Um, Roger Cassiopeia is, 
Okay, I gotta get. I've got my map upside down. There we go. Okay, Cassiopeia was was close. So remember that. I think she's, and it's too small for me to see. I think she's the one right next to the one that's brown. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Is she is okay? Thank you. Is right next to Cepheus. So go back to where Cepheus is, the crown. Yeah, there you go. Okay, there she is, Cassiopeia. She's that little one. Now bring her down a little. There you go. There you go. You're on her now. Okay. See Cepheus. You see the crown. So if you found him, you come just down, and you're seeing Cassiopeia. Okay. There's 55 stars that make up Cassiopeia. Anybody know what the number of five stands for in scripture? Yeah. Grace. The grace oh, of God. Oh. So I see double grace. Okay? Grace. Grace. Yeah, number five in scripture is when it's used symbolically, we see that it speaks of the grace of God. Okay? So two times grace. Grace, grace. Oh, wow. This is called the enthroned woman, the woman who's sitting on a throne also. <coughs> That does not mean she's sitting on the Lord's throne. He is high and lifted up. God and Jesus share a love seat made for two. They're the only ones on that throne. But it is showing the difference between Andromeda and Cassiopeia. You can see it where Roger's got the chart. You can see the chains for Andromeda still there. Remember, she was bound. She was falling. She needed mercy. She was Same suffering. Woman, right? Same so what, woman. It could be the same woman. They give it two different names, but it could be. It could be seeing her now free. Sure, you could say it that way. Because this is the captive delivered. She's preparing for her husband. That's why you see her adorning herself. Like she's holding a mirror and she's doing her hair. And she's sitting instead of falling and being bound. The ancient called her the daughter of splendor or the glorified woman. Let me read to you Romans 8.17. Romans 8 17 and in Romans 8 17 we have whoops oh, too far okay and if children heirs also heirs of God fellow heirs with Messiah if indeed we suffer with him we may also be glorified with him so if Andromeda is showing we redeem not yet receiving our full blessings but knowing they are ours now we are seeing ourselves receiving the fullness of those blessings. We have now come into the blessing that makes us a joint heir with Messiah. Remember, we are like his brethren. He calls us his brethren. Even though we are his children, we're also his brethren. And we come into all the blessings that when we are adopted in, we receive fully as if we were an original son or daughter. So Cassiopeia does have that splendor, that glory, she is showing us that, that uh, she is getting ready for her, her, uh, her husband, her bridegroom, I'll put it that way, because we know when we are raptured, we are the bride of Christ, and, and we will, go. yes, and we will go into the time where we'll have the consummation of the marriage, we'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb, so it all fits. The Arabic name for her was meant the freed. You know, as if not bound, but freed, okay? F-R-E-E-D, freed. Um, and there's also another name in Arabic associated with her that means the enthroned. So to sit on the throne, she had to be free. Uh, Cassiopeia, literally then we would say means the enthroned, the glorified, the beautiful, something like that. In her left breast, the star that is there means freed. The top of her chair, which is hard to see in this picture, at the top of her chair, the star that is there means the branch. And she has, and you see it better, I think, in my chart that I gave you, she has in her hand the branch of victory. It's in her left hand, and it's supposed to be a, a symbol of victory. She's resting in victory. Her hands are no longer bound. That's why she's arranging her robes, she's adorning her hair, she's getting herself beautiful. She's seated on the Arctic Circle, and close by her is the king. Well, if the king is Yeshua Jesus and he's our bridegroom, where would you expect to find the bride? Right next to the bridegroom, so it fits perfectly. Now, the bride, the lamb's wife, 
we know that the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem is our home and that's where we will be at his side. Let's go to Revelation 21 and we're going to go to verse 9 and I'm almost done for those who needed me to end at 3.30. I'm very close. If you can hang a couple minutes, I will end with this one. Verse 9 of Revelation 21. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, with Yochanan John, saying, Come here, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Okay, so we know we are the bride, we are the wife of the Lamb. And he was going to show him, and he took him up and he showed him the new Jerusalem, he carried him away in the spirit in verse 10. And then we see that that will come down out of heaven from God. That we know is our headquarters, Revelation 22. Come on. Come on, tablet. I'm trying to hurry. Revelation 22 shows us the crystal sea, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Um, we see that there's no sun because he is the son of it. And I'm looking for... Okay. Well, the closest I'm going to get to it right now. Here we go. Verse 17. No, no, no. I'm not going to take you 17. That could confuse you. Let me take you... To verse 12, Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to reward each one as his work deserves. This is coming into that fullness. We go into it. If you read chapters 21 and 22, you realize the new Jerusalem is our headquarters for all of eternity. That it is it's like our home base. We will be able to, to go out from it to serve the Lord wherever he sends us. We even do that during the millennium. We will see that. But we know this, this is a picture of us coming into our blessings. Now, Cephas is holding out his scepter toward her. When you look at the two, so you can see Cephas right there at the top of the chart. And the scepter is very, very close to Cassiopeia, almost touching her. He's holding out his scepter to her. She is accepted by him. Remember the book of Esther, when she had to go before the king, and she said, if he doesn't hold out his scepter, it means my death. That scepter meant he was, he was receiving her. He was accepting her. That's what we're seeing a picture of. And Ephesians 5 tells us that our um, bridegroom accepts us. Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 27. The Lord has given a picture of the church being, the, the body of Christ being like a marriage relationship. Um, when we read in verse 25, we read, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Messiah loved the church and gave himself up for her. If a husband loves his wife in a way that shows he's willing to lay down his life for her, I guarantee you that wife's got no issue with, with allowing him to be her head and uh, following his lead. Going on though, verse 26, so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. We know that's how we are cleansed, by the washing of the water uh, of the word of the Lord that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So this is what we're seeing. Cassiope is being brought in. She's seen holy. She's seen as blameless. She's seen in all her glory. No spot, no wrinkle. And all this she owes to the one who laid down his life for her, that he might receive her unto himself. Now, it's also believed to represent Israel in the sense that Jehovah, God the Father, calls Israel his restored wife. Um, it's like Israel it has that wife relationship with God the Father, and the church has the wife relationship with Yeshua, Jesus, the Son of God, even though the two are one. Let me show you very quickly, in closing, Isaiah 54, and verses 5 through 8 show us how the Lord Jehovah, God the Father, looks at Israel in this way. Isaiah 54, verse 5, For your husband is your maker. In Isaiah, we know God's speaking to Israel, not to the church. She's not in the book of Isaiah. Yeshia is a Jewish prophet to the nation of Israel. For your husband is your maker, verse 5, whose name is Adonai Zavaot, the Lord of Armies. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you, and we know who he's talking about. It's made it very clear in verse 5. He has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit. Even like a wife of one's youth when she's rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you. That would be when the Lord said, Okay, I will set my plan with Israel aside to bring in the Gentiles to provoke you to jealousy. 
not a total abandonment, not a turn my back on you, not a turn away from you. If that were true, Israel wouldn't be alive today. She would not have survived. The Jewish people would be wiped off the face of this earth. But it's as if he's turned away from her for a moment, just for a moment, to bring in the other. He says, he, but with great compassion, I will gather you. Um, and verse 8, in an outburst of anger, I hid my face for a moment, but with everlasting favor. Everlasting is everlasting. It doesn't end. It didn't end when God set aside his plan with Israel for a time. With everlasting favor, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now look at chapter 61, verses 10 and 11, just to finish the thought. Chapter 61, verses 10 and 11. And we read in these verses, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. Remember we get his robe of righteousness, the bride adorning herself, her robe. Her robe was given to her from the Lord. And it's interesting that in ancient times, the bridegroom would give the robe to, the, to his wife to be married in. Okay, he's clothed me with garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with a robe of righteousness as a groom puts on a turban as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Um, and verse 11, for as the earth produces its sprouts, as a garden causes the things sown up in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. He'll bring Israel into her fullness. He's bringing the church into her fullness. The two are seen as if the bride of the Father and of the Son, and we come in to receive all of the, the blessings that are promised to us. That's why she's adorning herself, she's getting herself ready. Here comes her bridegroom, here comes God the Father, culminating it all, bringing it all together. Now, do we have an enemy that wants to call that out? Yes. So next week when we start with the new material, we'll start with that enemy. We'll start with Cetus the sea monster, and we will see how he is put down because this bride comes in to her glory. She receives what God has promised. God is faithful to his word. He has given us many and great promises. They are ours. They are sure. They are promised. <coughs> God doesn't break his promises. He doesn't forget them. He doesn't renege. He doesn't change. Nothing. We see the faithfulness of our God, the faithfulness of his son, we stand so secure, we can claim the blessings of ours today. I live here on earth, but this is not my citizenship. My citizenship is in heaven. That's where my eternal home is. That's where all my blessings are waiting for me to receive in fullness. We get first fruits here. We get a little taste, but the best is yet to come. And it's right there. We are so close. If the polar star is showing us that the Lord is coming to rule and reign. The crown is on his head. We go seven years before he returns in that glory to set up his kingdom. We've got to be right there. He's got to be at the door. We're in last moments. We are in last breaths. This may be your last opportunity to do for the Lord. So go out this week praising God, singing hallelujah for his perfect plan, his timeless, well, his time his precision in time and at the same time don't just praise him but do what you can to bring others into that they can also enjoy these blessings okay on that note because it took me a little longer to, to do Cassiopeia than I thought I'll close in prayer real quick then I will open it for comments and questions you can let out the hallelujah so you can do anything you'd like to to praise his glory because he is our ruling king and he is faithful let's pray Lord God of heaven and earth, of all of creation, of the magnitude of the plan of time from the beginning to 2021 and to however long into the future time goes, we thank you for your mighty hand, that your plan is working out perfectly according to your plan, that it is seen so precise is an encouragement to us, Lord. You have us born at this day, at this time, for a purpose and a reason. Lord, let us do all that you have put us here for. Let us raise up to fulfill what you have given for each of us. And thank you that we know what is waiting for us on the other side, the eternal glories that nothing, no suffering in this world is worth even comparing to all that will be ours. Lord, the greatest blessing will be just to be in your presence with no sin, 
nothing to, to ruin the picture forever and ever. And even now, we sing our hallelujahs and our praises and give thanksgiving for the promises that, our, our, that, our, that are ours that we will see face to face one day soon. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you. Elohim Ha'in, Most High God, Yeshua Jesus, we love you and we praise you forever. Worthy of all praise and glory and honor and all. You are not the Lamb slain. You are the Lamb resurrected. Thank you, praise you, hallelujah, in Jesus' name, amen. What a note to end on. <laughs>